So tonight, I'm going to talk about faith for the next few minutes. And uh, any note takers in here? Anybody that's not a note taker, raise your hand. Okay. When I, at the end, when I talk about salvation, I want you guys to just lift that hand. You're joking. Okay. Take notes. Take notes. Because this is, we're going to go through three points tonight about faith. And I believe that when we have big faith, big faith and big expectation for what God wants to do in our lives, we will see his goodness. We won't yell to God, do you even love me? Even in the worst times of our life, we will know that he loves us when we have big faith. So the passage I want to preach out of tonight is found in Matthew chapter 14. And uh, to set this up a little bit, this is one of my favorite passages, but to set it up a little bit, um, Jesus has just fed the 5,000. Some people think it's like 15 or 20,000 people because the Bible records 5,000 men. But this huge miracle happens with a little boy's lunch, and Jesus multiplies it. A lot of us know that story. And all of these people eat. So the disciples just witness this amazing miracle. And then Jesus kind of wraps it all up. And he wants to go to the hillside to pray, and he tells the disciples to get into a boat and go to the other side of this lake. And so if you're the disciples and Jesus tells you to do something, you do it. So we're going to pick up in Matthew chapter 14, starting in verse 22, and it says this. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go go ahead of him to the other side. While he dismissed the crowd, after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night... He was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come out to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink and cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him and says, you of little faith. The King James says, ye of little faith. That's that famous verse. This is where it comes from. Ye of little faith. Why did you doubt? Verse 32, and when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. And those who were in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Of God, I love this uh, passage because I always just wondered what it would be like to walk on water. When, whenever somebody does something impossible, a human does something in scripture that's impossible, I, anybody else just dream of being a superhero when you were little and maybe still do? That was me. I always wanted to do impossible things and I've always loved this story, but I wanna pull, I, like I said, three things out of here, out of this story, three ways that we can have uncommon faith. If you want this uncommon faith to expect the biggest things, For God to do in your life, we need to do these three things. And number one is this, if you're taking notes. Number one, we need to remember what he's already done. We need to remember what God has already done in our lives. Matthew 14, 27 again said this, but Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. I want you to think about this. That one statement, Jesus is standing out on the water, the disciples think he's a ghost, And then all he says is, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. And immediately, peace comes over the disciples. And so much peace, Peter stands up, and he stands up and says, if it's really you, call me out. I want to do something impossible. The other disciples sit down, but Peter stands up. But what was it about that statement, it is I, that caused instant peace in the boat? Because if it was just some random guy, and he's like, hey, take courage, it's me, it's Joe. He's like some random rabbi standing on the water, you would just think it's weird or demonic. But because it's Jesus, that meant something to them. Why? Because this is Matthew chapter 14. They had already witnessed incredible miracles from Jesus. So when Peter and the rest of the disciples hear Jesus say, take courage, it's me, Jesus saying it's me meant something. Because they witnessed Jesus turning water to wine. They witnessed Jesus healing lepers. They witnessed Jesus bringing Jairus' daughter back to life. They witnessed Jesus healing a paralyzed man who was lowered through a roof in a house while Jesus was teaching, laid right in front of him, and Jesus heals him, and he stands up and walks out with his mat. Just a few chapters earlier, in Matthew chapter 8, the disciples are in another storm, 
and Jesus is asleep in the boat. And this storm comes and they're freaking out enough to where they actually think they're gonna die and they go wake Jesus up. He comes up to the bow of the ship and says, peace be still. They just witnessed in Matthew chapter eight all of nature bowing down to Jesus. So when Jesus in Matthew chapter 14, this story says, take courage, it's me. That meant something because they remembered. You wanna have uncommon faith in your life? You want to think and believe the biggest things about God, the best things about God in your life? You need to remember the things he's already done in your life. So the next time a storm comes, you don't think the worst about God. You think the best about God. You need to remember the miracles that he's already done. Do you do that? Do you remember what he's already done? I, uh, I read a sermon manuscript. I I'm, I'm, have this big time nerdy side of me. I read a sermon manuscript from 100 years ago. And this guy was talking about the spiritual disciplines. And if you don't know what the spiritual disciplines are, they're like typically prayer, Bible reading, church attendance, worship, those kinds of things. In his sermon on the spiritual disciplines, he listed the most important spiritual discipline that we can be in and interact with as the discipline of remembrance. And his whole entire sermon was about the human propensity to forget good things and remember bad things. Because when we get into a new storm in our life, we don't believe the best about God by default. We believe what we perceive to be the worst about God because there is no worst about God. We start to look at the gaps and say, God wasn't there in that. God wasn't there in that situation or in that situation when I was depressed. He wasn't there when my parents got divorced. He wasn't there when I had thoughts of suicide. Oh, he was. Because those were thoughts of suicide and you're alive right here, right now. And we try, and by default as humans, we remember and perceive that he wasn't there. But when we have the discipline of remembrance, every morning, the first thing we should do isn't ask God for things. We should be thanking him for things. So we remember what he's already brought us through. Do you guys agree with that tonight? We remember what he's already brought us through. And if you don't believe me, let's just look at this real quick. In Luke chapter 22... It's the famous setting of, of the Last Supper, and this is what it says in Luke twenty two nineteen. 19. It says, and he took the bread, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in what? Of me. Communion. Communion isn't just some spiritual ritual that we do just because Jesus said. Jesus created us. He knew that we would forget. He knew his human nature to forget. And Jesus said, you forget so much, you might even forget the cross if you don't do this. That's why the Bible says to do it often in remembrance of him so we understand the gospel. We don't forget what he did on the cross. We forget. We forget. But when we remember, when we remember, we can have uncommon faith. I did, in middle school, I did this report, this essay on um, Benjamin Franklin inventing the lightning rod. Anybody know what a lightning rod is? Okay, if you don't, hopefully you write a report on this. But I did this report in middle school on Benjamin Franklin, and he originally was trying to invent the lightning rod, this metal rod on the top of of buildings, of roofs of houses and buildings. He was doing it to originally attract power from lightning to try to create electricity. And what ended up happening was we use it so now buildings don't get burned down and all that kind of thing. But the original purpose was if I can get a lightning rod up into the sky, the power from the lightning bolt will hit the rod and I can channel its power. That's what I view remembering as spiritually. That when we remember the goodness of God, it's like we're holding up a spiritual lightning rod saying, God, if you're gonna do something big, do it through me because I remember what you've already done in my life and I believe you're gonna do it again. Use me. So when we look at this story in Matthew chapter 14 with Peter, that's what's happening. When I read this story, and one of the reasons it's my favorite, one of my favorites is I've always wondered why the other disciples sat down when Jesus said, take courage at his eye, and Peter jumps up and says, if it's you, call me out. Why was there such a big difference between Peter and the other disciples? When Jesus tells you and reassures you, I'm in control, it's me. I've got your life in my hand. It's gonna be okay. Do you sit back and relax? Or do you take that as an initiative to stand up 
and say, if you're gonna do something great, do it through me. If it's really you, call me out to you. I wanna do something impossible. I'm gonna be honest with you guys. I have never, ever, ever woken up any morning and thought, God, I want you to do something extremely average through me today. I've never thought that, but sometimes I live like that. Sometimes we live and our life is saying, God, either don't do anything through me or do something extremely average. What we should be doing is proclaiming every day, I remember your goodness. I remember that you were there in this situation, in that situation. And when it comes time to call me out on the water, count me in. I'm standing up. I'm standing up. But it comes through remembering. We want uncommon faith. We have to remember. Number two, the second thing we have to do is recognize what he's doing now. So number one, we need to remember what he's already done. Number two, recognize what he's doing now. Did you know that God is doing something incredible right this second in your life? You might be aware of it or you might not be. But again, as humans, what we do is if we are not actively aware of it, we start to believe that he's not doing anything. Has God ever shown you anything ever in your life to where you would actually consciously believe he's not up to something good right now? No, because if you've been a Christian for very long, you've seen the goodness of God. But we start forgetting again, and we stop looking at what he's doing now. I want you to think about that. What is God doing now in your life? Matthew 14, 29, again from the story, says, Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. I want you to think about this. Can you imagine, anybody ever been out on a boat before, a lake or ocean or anything? Raise your hand. I know you guys are like Sooners fans, and you're in the great plane. I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> Roll Tide. Where's my guy? You didn't raise your hand when I said Roll Tide, so you're not even a real fan. All right, Boomer. That's the first and last time I'll ever do that in my life. That's just for you. All right. I don't even know what I was saying. I'm going to pretend like I know. Oh, yeah. If you've ever been on a boat. Okay, so can you imagine what that must have felt like? Sometimes we read Bible stories and hear them so much that we become numb to how crazy they are. Can you imagine Peter actually stepping out of the boat and testing the water? Your brain would be saying, that is liquid. This is impossible. You are about to do something that would defy every law of nature. And when Peter puts his foot out, it's firm. It's firm. And he starts walking on water. If you're Peter, and what I think when I read this story, if I'm Peter, there is no way, there is no way that if I was walking on water that I would ever doubt the power of Jesus ever again. There's no way. I'm, I think that. Sometimes I think I would never, ever, ever doubt Jesus ever again if I could go back and witness him calming the storm. If I could go see him heal that paralytic, I would never. If I saw what the disciples saw, I would never doubt again. But how many of the disciples would look at you and say, if I experienced what God did in their life, I would never doubt again. We doubt because we're human. But Peter was walking on water. And if you know the story, especially because I just read it, Peter starts to doubt again, and he starts to have fear because of some wind and some waves, and he starts to sink. I love Peter. I love Peter because he gives us all hope. Peter is just this bipolar basket case. He's up, and he's down. He's up, and he's down. Then he's seeing his counselor. Then he's up, and he's down. I mean, it's, that's Peter. Peter gives us all hope because he's bold in one second. If it's you, call me out. He's walking on water. He's like, he's walking on water. And then he's like, I don't even know if I believe this anymore. I'm like, dude, you're walking on water. You're not recognizing what God is doing right now. Right now. I want you to think about this. If you're here and you're alive, you're walking on water. Every one of us have a story about why we shouldn't be living right now. There was a car accident. There was a story when you were born. There was something that happened in your life. You shouldn't be here right now, but guess what? You are. You're walking on water. You're walking on water. Do you guys believe that? You're walking on water. Every one of you is a living miracle. And just as a side note, God is never, ever, ever, this part where Peter steps out, God will never, Jesus will never call you to do something great without calling you out of something and into something else. He always calls you out of something, and most of the time, it's unhealthy friendships, unhealthy relationships. It's a level of being comfortable. Sometimes, it's, I, it could be anything. 
I mean, I know for a fact with this many teenagers, I was the youth pastor at our church for nine and a half years. I loved being a youth pastor. I still meet with teenagers because I think I'm always going to be a youth pastor. And I can tell you this, from all the teenagers that I've talked with and, and what I know about statistics, there are people in here right now that you're in a relationship with someone and it needs to end. It just does. If you're 14 or 15 years old and you're saying I love you, you don't, I mean, you just don't. My, my daughter's 14 and she's messaging this guy on Instagram. He's a good guy, but he tells her, I love you. And he didn't know that I read all of her Instagram messages. So I go, hey man, this is Avery's dad, Pastor Dustin. And um, I just wanna tell you, she's not allowed to say I love you, ever. So you can say I like you, never say I love you again. And he texts me back and goes, okay, I'll try. And I go, no, no, no. I run him back and said, you're not gonna try. You will, or this is done. Like you're not even gonna be her friend, okay? She's not allowed to date. She says I love you, I'm just gonna be like, ha ha, you have no idea. Okay, no idea. Some of you are in friendships right now. I have watched people now that are on our worship team and leading in our church, now they're doing amazing things for God, but they lost years of their life because they would not separate themselves from a certain group of friends that were holding them back. God can always redeem everything, but we can sometimes control how long it takes us to get there. We can delay God's promise and call on our life because we're not stepping out from being comfortable. So I want you to think about this. Back to the story, when, when Peter's walking on water, in Matthew 14, 30, it's gonna come up on the screen, it says this, but when Peter saw the wind and the waves, when he saw what, the what? He became afraid and began to sink, and he shouted, Lord, save me. So hold on, let me, let me get this straight. He's walking on water, which is, he's literally, through Jesus' power, defying the laws of nature. That's impossible. And he's walking on water. Then, the next little obstacle comes, wind and waves, and he's thinking, this is his logic, I know I'm doing this impossible thing, and Jesus has control over this, but I don't believe he has control over the next thing that's coming. We do that all the time. We, we, we might have enough faith for what I'm going through now, and then we make it through it, and we're like, man, I'm doing it, it's impossible, I shouldn't even be here right now, this is amazing, thank you, God. Then the next storm comes, you're like, I don't even know if I believe in God anymore. I think I'm leaving church, and those people didn't say that they, blah, 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 and then we start walking away and doubting and having fear that God and Jesus has control over the next storm, and he has the control over the one right now, and we start forgetting and forgetting. When you go back to Matthew chapter 8, I think this is pretty interesting. Just a few chapters earlier, like I mentioned, is that other storm, when Jesus calms the storm, and it says this in, in verse 26 of Matthew 8, Jesus answered, why are you afraid? You don't have enough faith. Then Jesus got up and gave a command to the wind and the waves, and it became completely calm. So I want you to hear this part right here. The men, the disciples, these were the disciples. The men were amazed and said, what kind of man is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. So it says, the men, the disciples. Guess who one of these men was? Peter. Out of Peter's mouth in Matthew chapter 8, he says, wow. Even the wind and the waves bow down to this guy. Surely he is the son of God. Fast forward to Matthew 14. Peter's walking on water. And the Bible says some wind and waves come. And Peter starts doubting that Jesus can have control of the very thing that Jesus demonstrated control over just a few chapters earlier. Guys, again, we do this constantly. I don't believe that you can handle that relational issue or this thing going on in my mind or that fear. I don't, I don't know, Jesus, if you can handle this level of anxiety when he literally just handled it. The wind and the waves. The wind and the waves. The next time, whatever the wind and the waves are in your life, the next time they come, look over your shoulder and say, he's already handled the wind and the waves in my past. That means he'll handle them again in the future. You have to recognize what he's doing now, that you're walking on water. You're a living, walking miracle. And if that is true, you're already doing something impossible. Give the next impossible thing to him and stop fearing or we'll sink. Stop fearing or we'll sink. I think it's interesting, something we cannot forget when Peter stepped out of the boat, that made him, or when he said, hey, if it's you, call me out, that made him unique. 
His big faith made him unique in that moment. I want to ask you, does your faith make you unique from the rest of the crowd, even believers? I, I, like I said at the beginning, I want my faith in my life. There are a lot of days I doubt, but I want the overall faith in my life to be big. And I know faith isn't a competition. That's not what I'm saying at all. But when everyone else sits down, I'm going to stand up. I'm going to say, if you're going to do something great, if you're going to do something great in this world with all of this brokenness, with all of this, this divide in our nation, all of the pain, all of the suffering, if you're going to do something great, God, I believe that you will do it through me. And I don't believe that that's something selfish. I don't believe that, that that's self-centered. That's what, exactly what Peter did. Yeah. If it's you, call me out. Yeah. And I, I think there's teenagers here tonight that that needs to be your response to Jesus tonight. If it's really you whispering those things in my ear and showing me glimpses of my future, if it's really you, call me out. Yeah. Call me out. Because if you don't stand up, you shrink back into the crowd. Yeah. And the lightning rod comes down. And then you're going to watch someone else step up and do what you did not accept the call to do. That's not the life I want to live. And I know it's not the life you want to live. And it may not even be full-time ministry. It might be. It might be you're a businessman, businesswoman. Some of the greatest leaders in our church are elementary teachers. I mean, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing what God does through people in full-time ministry and outside of full-time ministry. We just have to accept the call. Number three, we need to trust what he'll do tomorrow. We need to trust what he'll do tomorrow. So let me ask you, what has God spoken to you about your future? And you might be thinking, I don't, I don't know if he ever has. Have you ever asked? Have you ever said, if it's you, call me out? When I was 16 years old, I was raised as a pastor's kid. My parents are my pastors now. And um, they are actually, this January, celebrating 37 years in one church. It's pretty awesome. I forgot to honor my parents. Honor my parents. So that's cool. <laughs> but I grew up a pastor's kid. And um, at 16 years old, I was at a camp. And um, it's a setting just like this. And I was not necessarily even emotionally stirred that night. But the altar call was on accepting the call of God. And I had always kind of liked the idea of being a pastor because my dad was an awesome example. He lived what he preached. I, I wanted to be a pastor because he was a great one, is a great one. But I had never really officially felt called by God. So I just came forward, not really an emotional night at all, and just walked forward and, and just said, God, if it's you, call me. What do you want me to do? And I remember kneeling down and all of a sudden, I just felt God speaking to me. And there's only a few times in my life ever where I can actually look at you and say, I know for a fact God spoke. Sometimes I can say I feel like he was. I know for a fact God spoke to me that night and called me into full-time ministry. But here's what's interesting. When he calls you into or out of something, out of an old life, into a calling, guess where the calling normally starts? A storm. A storm. I accepted the call of God at 16 years old, and immediately that August, I go back, I'm a junior in high school, I had always loved speaking in front of people, I liked reading out loud in class, I was always the volunteer, and I remember we were reading the syllabus, I don't know if you guys do this here, but we would like read past the syllabus around, or I don't know, row by row, and I would try to count ahead which paragraph I was going to read, anybody did that? And then you always get the wrong one, you're like, I'm a junior in high school, how did I count wrong? But anyways... It gets to me, and I start reading out loud, and I had never known what anxiety was, what real deep fear was, but I had an all-out anxiety attack, lost um, all ounce of breath, and almost passed out and had to run out into the hall, and I had never experienced anything like that in my life. For three years, I battled severe anxiety, depression, and the biggest fear was public speaking when I got called into full-time ministry. I remember graduating high school 20 pounds lighter than I was as a junior in high school because I had stopped eating. I remember going to Southwestern, actually, my freshman year with such deep-rooted fear and anxiety to preach, wondering, why am I coming here to learn how to preach? Because this is a joke. I need to be done. 
and through a series of just all out, honestly, just warfare prayer, my parents praying for me, my grandparents, I mean, it, it just came to a head and there were some miracles happening. It's a long story where I was able to break free from some of the severe anxiety. But I'll be honest with you, every single time right before I get up to speak, I have this, and I, I can feel the enemy saying, can I get you? Can I get you? And I have to trust that God has brought me. I've preached thousands of times. He's brought me through every storm, every single season, and I'm here, and I'm preaching, and I've had to overcome amazing, crazy things in my life. But I'm telling you this to say, you can't expect for God to call you out with big faith to change this world and expect for there not to be a storm. And it's not necessarily God causing the storm, but it's him using the storm. And that's what I had to come to terms with. God didn't cause that in my life. I believe the enemy did, but I also knew deep down what I came to terms with that God was using it to sharpen me. And now every single time before I get up to speak, I have that check physically, and it's a reminder to give God the gift spiritually. And it's saying, I can't do this on my own. I've got to give it to you. Speak through me. So whatever it is in your life, he's going to call you out of something, but it's probably going to be your first step as a storm. So what has he called you to in your future? What has he spoken to you about your life? Because here's what we know in scripture. No person ever created is an accident, ever. I want you to think about this. You were knit together in your mother's womb by God. We all have crazy circumstances in our life, and you might look at your circumstances and say, why would a good and loving God put me in this? There's all kinds of questions that we ask as humans, and that's fine, but I want to remind you, God never goes, whoops, didn't mean to make that one. You have destiny, you have purpose, there's something specific that he has for you in your future. And let me tell you this, well, all, all those nine and a half years I was a youth pastor, I mean, now some of those teenagers are in their upper 20s, and I've watched some of them follow the path of God and some of them not. And here's what's crazy. You can choose at this age whether or not you're going to run in the lane in which God created you to run, or you're going to create your own and have constant friction in your life. Every adult in here will tell you this one thing, that if you fight the call of God in your life, you will not have fulfillment, you will not have joy, you will not have stability, because why would you, if you're trying to live a life that God did not create you to live, you're gonna be in constant friction with him. But when you realign and get in the right lane, the right path, life isn't perfect, there's bumps, mostly because we're idiots sometimes, but God realigns us, but when we're in his path, we have fulfillment, we have peace, we have boldness, and we learn to trust God with our future. So what is he speaking to you about your future? What is he speaking? And Matthew 14, 31 uh, through 33 says this. It, this is my favorite part. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him, caught Peter. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. Uh, let me be honest with you. I would have been a horrible Jesus because I want you to look at this in scripture, in the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Almost every single big miracle, these disciples, these boneheads, at the end of it, go, whoa, truly, you are the son of God. And if you're Jesus, at what point do you just look at him and go, how many times are you gonna say that? At what point are you gonna believe I'm the son of God when it doesn't feel like I'm the son of God? At what point am I only the son of God when it's coming and it's working out your way? Or am I the son of God throughout the entire process? I mean, at what point? We do that same thing. I mean, when everything's great, we're like, God, truly, you are the son of God. It's so easy to worship. When things aren't great, you're like, truly, I hope and pray that you are the son of God because it doesn't really feel like it. But this whole story, when it comes down to what it's about, I also think it's interesting, Matthew 14, when you look at this story and what it's titled, you can look in your Bible. It's not called Peter walking on water. What is it called? Jesus walking on water. When Jesus first appeared to Peter, he says, hey, don't be afraid, it's me, when he appeared to the disciples. And Peter says, if it's you, let me walk out to you. Peter didn't say, if it's you, let me walk on water. He said, if it's you, let me come to you. 
The whole story was about Jesus. The whole story was Peter wanting to get close to Jesus, and the byproduct was walking on water. The byproduct was walking on water. It was about Jesus. And let me say, if there's one thing that causes people not to live out their life with deep faith, big faith, it's because somewhere along the way, they forget that Jesus truly is the Son of God, and they stop wanting to walk to him, and they want to start doing something impossible for the sake of doing something impossible when it was Jesus who was the one who made it possible in the first place. People that pursue ministry, I've seen people over and over and over again, if you're pursuing full-time ministry, I want you to hear me with this. If you're getting ready to go into an internship at a church or a Bible college, whatever it might be, you're gonna start off saying, Jesus, if, it is, if it's you, tell me to come out to you. And somewhere along the way, I think it's one of the enemies, Satan's greatest tactics, he starts to convince you that it's about you walking on water rather than you walking to Jesus. And then all of a sudden it starts to be about your stage time and your speaking reps and your followers on Instagram and Twitter and how many people are watching your snaps and your Insta stories. And all of a sudden you think the caption should say your name walking on water, but it's Jesus walking on water. That's what it's all about. And I've seen people drop out of the faith, drop out of ministry, because they forget it's about Jesus walking on water. They forgot the gospel, they forgot the grace, they forgot what Jesus did on the cross, and it starts to become about them, and they get self-centered. And it doesn't matter if you're pursuing full-time ministry or not, this is dangerous no matter what. People only walk away from Jesus when they forget that he's the son of God. And you're thinking, there's no way Guys, the disciples did every other day. I think there's a reason Jesus said, take up your cross daily and follow me because I don't think humans can make it a day without dying to themselves, without themselves wanting to be Jesus instead of Jesus. We have to die to ourselves daily, daily, and we have to believe that he's the son of God. Do you really know what that means? When I was five years old, I raised my hand in children's church, we used to, it was in a gym, and we had this red line at the front, and so it was like, hey, if you wanna receive Jesus as your savior, come down and stand on the red line. Red symbolizes the blood of Jesus, and even as a five-year-old, I'm like, no. It's because the basketball paint was red, and you're just trying to capitalize. Anyways, so I'm standing on the front, and I got saved every week because I was afraid I was gonna miss the rapture, but it is what it is. And so I, I would raise my hand, and I would pray, and I was like, hey, Jesus, I invite you to my heart. And I believe it was as genuine as I could make it. But I'm going to be super honest with you. Can I be like really vulnerable? I was three years into being the youth pastor at my church in a Bible study one morning by myself when I actually fully started to grasp the gospel. That Jesus, you did what? You, you came in, in everything I've done in my life, the secrets, the darkness, the things that people do know about, the things in high school, all, the thing, all those things, you're just giving me everything and taking that away? I get eternity, I get the life you deserve when you took the life on the cross that I deserve, that death, and I started understanding that and grasping it. I'm being honest, I was three years into being a youth pastor when I felt like I could adequately talk about the cross, and that's bad. But let me tell you, if you're not careful, it's gonna be you too. You need to understand what Jesus did for yourself. Not just that you grew up in church. Growing up in church is great, but you can also become numb to who Jesus really is. Sometimes we forget what radical grace is because we've convinced ourselves that we've never actually needed it, but we do. And Jesus has to, has to, has to be the son of God, the savior and Lord of your life. Not someone you ask things of, but someone you thank them for everything they've done. Second Corinthians 5, 7 is, is probably my favorite verse in the Bible about faith. And um, it says this, for we live by faith, not by sight. The Apostle Paul wrote this to the church of Corinth, for we live by faith, not by sight. So while I was the youth pastor, I was also the young adult pastor. And a lot of the young adults would use this, atheist young adults actually would come sometimes and like try to find me in hallways afterwards and like debate me on stuff. And I was like, no, I'm not good at debates, I'm out of here. But they would use this verse and say, this proves, this proves that you want us to check our brain at the door and shut off thinking and just have blind faith. Because they're saying the Bible actually says, 
For we live by faith, not by sight. So you're telling us to close our eyes and just believe? There's an element of that that could be true. That at some point, faith is something you can't see. But I want you to view it like this. A few years ago, I was, I was um, with a friend, and, and there's a guy in our church who has been a pilot for years and years and years in the Air Force. And he had a couple of those little prop planes. Anybody ever been in a small, like, propeller plane? They're kind of scary. Don't recommend it. But I was flying with him a bunch because he was trying to get more hours. And I got into this conversation with him one time because we were in a little bit of a storm. And we were trying to land. And when I was asking him about how to land in the storm, did you ever get nervous? And he said, no. He said, I remember one time, you know, several times, we're landing in fog and storms where there's zero visibility. Zero visibility. And he said, what happens is, if I, if I try to look out the window, out of the windshield, when there's zero visibility, I can't rely on what I see. I have to rely on what I know. I have to look down at the instruments, look down at the panel, and rely on what I was trained to know. Rely on what I know to be true about aviation, what I know to be true about flying and landing a plane, because when there's zero visibility, what does sight have to offer? All it offers is blindness. But when you rely on what you know to be true, you have clear sight. And when we think about our faith, that's what 2 Corinthians 5, 7 is saying. It's saying when you rely on physical sight, you're going to do what Peter did. He's going to look at the wind and the waves. You're going to look at the wind and the waves and look out that windshield of life going, that's bad, and I don't know what to do. Instead of Peter relying on what was right in front of him, Jesus the answer to all of it, the one who controlled nature was standing right in front of him, but Peter opened his physical eyes and shut his spiritual eyes. And he saw the wind and the waves and he started to doubt who Jesus was. I just wanna say, don't do that. Don't just look at circumstances. God genuinely, obviously cares about your circumstances. He sees your pain and has deep compassion. That's the purpose of Jesus being sent was because of God's love and compassion for us. He doesn't just dismiss your circumstances no matter what they look like, but what he is telling us, and what I'm gonna ask you, what do you believe to be true about God, about the word of God, about all of this, why we live? What's the purpose of everything? What do you believe to be true? What is your source of truth? In this day and age right now, we need a constant source of truth and it's the word of God. And so when we see all the storms in life, when we look out this windshield, our eyes, and see all this chaos and the things that are going on in your life and around the world and whatever's going on, we can get overwhelmed. But that's when we need to look down and rely on what we know to be true, not by what we are seeing right now. And that only comes from knowing the word of God. It only comes from trusting Jesus as the truth. Jesus says, I am truth. Everything I say is truth. I am truth. Some of you are here tonight and you really don't see a lot of hope. Um, even after all this and what I'm saying, you're still like, yeah, but that's probably for somebody else. And I don't see a lot of hope. I don't see a way out of this. I just feel like I'm, I'm sinking because of that storm, whatever. And you're probably looking at me going, well, if you're a pastor's kid your whole life and blah, 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 what do you know about storms and having to trust God and blah, 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 blah. Well, I'll tell you. Can you guys put my family picture back up, please? Um, I, Mandy and I, as soon as I come back up, oh, Mandy and I have been married for six years um, last month. Six years. So hold on, start doing the math. Six years. 14 years old, 12 years old, eight years old. The three oldest kids aren't my biological kids. Mandy was married before, and they were worship pastors together at a church for nine years. And I'm not gonna go into all of the details, it's personal stuff, but her ex-husband, um, through a series of events, made some decisions and, and wanted to live a life that wasn't what he was living and left. And Mandy was a, a single mom with three kids. And she was living across the country and I didn't know her. And I started helping their church randomly with some student ministry stuff and went and spoke at their camp and met Mandy. And I instantly was like, it's a long story, it's a little bit more in depth than this, but I instantly was like, I feel like this is it. I remember coming home and talking with my dad. I flew back, I'm coming home talking to my dad and I'm going, hey, I feel like I met my wife, but she's divorced and has three kids. 
So I don't know if I can wrap my mind, I'm just being honest, I don't know if I can wrap my mind around this. Every time I say this, Mandy, if she's here, she's like laughing. Because that's what my honest thought. I, I feel like this is it, but divorce with three kids, I just, I don't know. And I was a youth pastor. I was 27, almost 28 years old um, at this point. And I used to, you might think that's young, but when you're a youth pastor single for five and a half years, you start thinking, is something wrong with me? I, I want to do... I want to do ministry with somebody, and I don't really know what's happening. So I was lonely, and I was like, oh, I'm starting to have, you know, weird thoughts and depression and all this kind of stuff because of it. And little did I know that God was working something for his good that looked completely hopeless. And what's crazy is I had a lot of, of, of fearful thoughts when we first got married, and, and are, are the kids going to really look at me as dad? And is there ever a scenario of me ever actually being their dad? And honestly, I was just filled with fear and a lot of that and thought, no way. No way. There's so many things that could go wrong with, with uh, relationship stuff. And, and what, if, what if Avery, our oldest, never looks at me like her dad? And what if she gets to be a teenager and she is rebellious because I'm not her dad and her other dad left? And, and all, I, all of these things would just go in my mind. But here's what I had to do. I had to live what I'm preaching right now. I had to go, no, stop. What do I know about God? He brought me through that storm. He brought me through the storm when I was 16. He brought me through the storm when I was 21. He brought me through the storm when I had my own thoughts of suicide. He brought me through the storm when I was going through depression. He brought me through all of these different storms, and I'm even making up potential storms. That's what we do. But I start thinking, and he's going to bring me through that one, and he's going to bring us through that one. And here's what's cool. Three years ago this December, we're standing in a courtroom, and I was able to officially adopt the three older kids. It's cool. So they're Woodwards. And here's what's awesome. We're standing in this courtroom, and the judge was awesome. And he has the three older kids stand up. And we're like all emotional basket cases, and I'm going to try to get through this right now. But he has the three older kids stand up, and he says, are you three fully aware of what's happening today? And they, you know, yes, sir. And they said, the guy standing next to you, Dustin, is absolutely going to be your dad. And he said, here's what's interesting. And he held up their birth certificates. He said, you're getting new birth certificates today. And he said, Dustin's name is going to be on your birth certificate as if he was in the room when you were born. And um, I just started crying when we were sitting in this courtroom. And I'm like, this guy's preaching the gospel. He doesn't even know. We need to bring him as a guest speaker. You know, like, and, and he said, your, your old name is, is going to be gone. And when you walk out of here, you're a Woodward. And he said, this is your father. And, you know, we're all like, ah, you know, crying. And it was awesome. But here's what I'm telling you. Don't ever look at someone and think, they don't understand my pain. Pain is relative. Pain is pain. Your pain is as great as mine. Mine is as great as yours. We all have pain and we all have to trust God. We all have to trust God and we have to think the best about God because he's shown us the best about him. He is good. And time and time and time again in my life, and Mandy used to tell me when she was sitting in her house as a single mom, and she just started wrapping her mind around, this is going to be my life, and I'm okay with that, God, and this is going to be my life, and I'm going to make it through, and I'm going to make it through. And there are so many crazy stories with this, but this is what I can tell you. We are living proof that when the enemy comes in and tries to destroy, God says, not yet. And he rebuilds and reweaves something that's a miracle that we could have never, ever imagined or put together ever. Last week, we had a, a big one-night thing in our youth ministry, and I'm watching my 14-year-old daughter on the stage leading worship. And I'm sitting there thinking, you're so good, God. You're so good. You did all of this. And I can't ever doubt. Don't let me ever forget your goodness and your faithfulness, because you made this. And whatever the mess is in your life, he'll put it back together. But you've got to stand up and say, if it's really you, call me out on the water. Call me out if it's you, because I believe the best about you. I believe the best about you.